Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, When Donut Meets Croissant. In the next hour, we'll be talking about how France and the US do business differently and what cultural differences you should keep in mind in order to avoid any faux pas. Uh, my name is Daphne. I am the North America representative for Choose Paris Region. For those of you who don't know Choose Paris Region yet, we are the Economic Development Agency of the Paris Region. Our mission is to advise international companies looking to expand to the Paris region. We provide all the resources you need to accelerate your business in France. That can be market insight, connection to the ecosystem, legal support, recruitment, and much more. Now, before we get to the agenda today and introduce our panelists, I wanted to go uh, over a few quick housekeeping items. So first, will there be a recording of the session? Yes, you will receive the link to the replay at the end of the webinar. Next, you can hear us, we can't hear you. So there are a couple of ways to communicate. Look at the tab on the right of your screen. You can use the chat tab to comment the discussion or let us know if there is a technical issue. You can say hello, hello, William. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of this webinar. So make sure you use the Q&A tab to ask your questions. You can also vote for your favorite questions so they can bring them up uh, and make sure you will answer them. Finally, we will ask you some of the questions by the poll tab. So actually, you can go check it right now and let us know if you're a donut or a croissant. So while you do so, uh, let's take a look at the agenda. We will start uh, with a few key figures about Americans in Paris region. Then we will leave the floor to our two guest speakers for discussions about do's and don'ts when doing business with French people. In the following section, you will learn more about Choose Paris Region Global Mobility Services to help companies relocate their employees to France. We'll end with a Q&A session and some information about our upcoming webinars and contact details so you can stay in touch after the event. All good? Yeah, so let's get started. So today, I have the great pleasure to welcome an all-female panel. And as I introduce our guest speakers, I will ask each of them one question, and they will have one minute or less to answer. So our first guest is Delphine Joubert. Hello, Delphine. everyone. Hello, Delphine. So Delphine, you're a certified professional coach. Uh, Delphine supports business professionals with questions related to global career transitions, how to develop business in France without a French passport, and how to retain international employees who work in France. Delphine grew up in an international environment, and she has worked in Paris, Dublin, and London. So Delphine, when we prepared this webinar, we realized that the release of Emily in Paris uh, on Netflix was quite timely. So I've yeah. got <laughs> the inspiration for my question to you by one of the French characters of the show, uh, who says to Emily, I think the Americans have the wrong balance. You live to work, we work to live. So how true is that? Huh. I wish it were as clear cut as that. Uh, there are workaholics in both countries, obviously. Uh, and when you meet someone for the first time in France, you usually ask them what they do for a living, as it's a strong element of their social identity. Um, but it's true that the French uh, have a strong attachment to their holidays. Uh, as you might know, the minimum legal standard is five weeks uh, per year, whatever level of seniority you have. Um, and until recently, remote working was not very widespread in France. It was only about 15% uh, of people in France working remotely versus an average of 30% in the US, which means that in France, when you're not at work, you don't work, you live. <laughs> Well, thank you. That was great insight. And uh, actually, uh, you who are listening, you have a poll tab also, so you can let us know if you think that's true or false. And I'm curious to hear more about what you have to say in a couple of minutes. And so next, uh, we have Chloe Ferrarotti, or very own American in Paris. So Chloe grew up in the US and attended the Lycée Francais in Los Angeles. She moved to Paris two and a half years ago. Today, she works for a social media marketing startup as an enterprise account manager. So Chloe, 
you had a personal attachment to France and you really wanted to come to work to France. And I love the way you managed to find a job in Paris. It involves getting a flight ticket to Vegas. <laughs> Could you share this story with us? Absolutely. Bonjour and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chloe, and I was actually able to land a job in Paris at a start for a startup um, from Grenoble when I attended CES, which is the Consumer Electronic Shows for all those techies and startup innovation um, people out there on the webinar. <laughs> that is how I actually landed my job, was um, meeting people at La French Tech. I actually met a few of the people here today on Choose Paris region as well. So if you're at CES in 2018, bonjour again. <laughs> But yes, I like to tell people in Paris that it's thanks to Las Vegas that I actually got a job here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Chloe, and we're glad you, you made it to Paris. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and finally, I am pleased to introduce my colleague, Isabelle Morin. Isabelle is our global expansion manager. She's an expert in international relations, She's fluent in English, Spanish, Italian, and French. Um, so, Isabel, you help a lot of people from all over the world settling in Paris region. From what you've seen, what personality trait stands out the most in Americans? Well, I think in business, the difference between French people and Americans is the goal to achieve. What matters for Americans is the result and not the way to get there. Americans can trust you more easily than French people, and they can give you all their necessary resources without discussing, but you might get, get straight to the point and meet their needs. Yeah, no, I agree with that. So thank you, thank you. I think it was a great first insight to start. And actually, Isabelle, you can keep the mic as it is time to move to our next section. Americans in Paris, who are they? Where are they? Okay, thank you, Daphne. So in Paris, more than 2.5 million American tourists choose to visit the French capital every year. Well, except this year, of course. And those who choose to stay can count on a large community of compatriots. More than 14,000 Americans live in Paris region, including 3,500 executives and more than 1,700 students. In Paris region, expatriates can easily join a large and dynamic community of English-speaking people through social network groups with different topics. For daily life, business-oriented, websites, expatriate with networks, etc. For example, we can name some famous organizations. For economy and business, first, You have the American Chamber of Commerce, called the AmCham. For leisure and culture, the American Club of Paris, the American Center for Art and Culture, the American Women's Group in Paris. For students, there are all the American, diff the different university clubs, like Boston, Harvard, New York, etc., and the American University Clubs in France. And for daily life, You have the American Library, Brentonos, the American Church, the American Cathedral, etc. With the English or bilingual activities for children and the whole family, newcomers will be able to find support, advice, tips, and opportunities to meet new peoples, uh, new people, and compatriots. Now, the U.S. companies in Paris region. And Paris region has always been a very attractive destination for Americans. The United States have been the leading investor country in Paris region for many years. There are now mo more than 2,400 U.S. companies in Paris region. As a comparison, there are 4,400 American companies in the whole country. So half of the total American companies in France are in Paris region. These companies represent 165,000 jobs in the region. Amongst them, you can find a lot of small companies and startups, but there are also sales offices or head offices of big companies, like you can see IBM, Facebook, Cisco, Google, etc. 
Some of them settled their European headquarters in Paris region. You have here a few examples of all these US companies. Now I hand over to Delphine. Yes, thanks, Isabel. Uh, hi, everyone, again. Uh, I'm just going to turn off my camera just uh, because I'm not sure my internet connection is stable enough, but hopefully you'll keep on hearing my voice throughout. Um, so to, to start with, when we first started to discuss about doing a webinar together with the Choose Paris region team, we wanted to help Americans be better prepared at what to expect when they work with French people. Ultimately, to be more su successful in their French endeavors, we thought this could apply to Americans who do business with French people. Uh, this could apply when Americans want to start a new business in France or when an American is starting a new job in France. But don't worry if you're not an American today. Throughout my presentation, I will share insights into how both countries compare so that if your project is actually to go work in the US, you should also find useful insights and tips today. As a career coach for expats, I wanted to focus this webinar on work-related questions, on business-related questions with a cross-cultural perspective. And before we deep dive into cultural differences in business between French and Americans, I'd like to say a couple of things. First, there are more similarities between France and the US as Western cultures than there are with other countries, say Egypt or China. But for the sake of today's theme, I'll mainly focus on what distinguishes both cultures, comparing the relative position of one culture to another, so as to highlight some surprises you might have when doing business across the Atlantic. Second, everybody is unique. Yet social control ensures that most people will not deviate from the local norm from the central tendency in a given culture. All Americans don't behave in the same way, obviously, nor do the French. Cross-cultural intelligence is about commonalities and likelihood. So my goal today is obviously not to maintain stereotypes between the French and the Americans, like movies or series tend to. Tend to. Uh, as you can see on the visuals, yes, it does rain in Paris every, every now and then. So my goal is to make sure that you are asking yourselves the right questions when you come across an unknown or uncomfortable situation with the other culture. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be asking five questions on communication and context, on rules and relations, on status, on decision-making process, and finally, on negative feedback and the value of saying no and disagreeing. There are three me main messages I'm trying to lend in this webinar. The first one is that when you are discovering another culture, it's more important to observe and to ask yourself the right questions rather than to become a cross-cultural expert. No matter the number of years that you've lived abroad so that that's why I framed this presentation to highlight questions to help you better decode and negotiate cultural complexity. Second message, there is obviously no right or wrong way to do business when it comes to intercultural differences. However odd the French may behave in your opinion, they most certainly feel the same about you. So this webinar is about showing you how to acknowledge differences as potential common grounds. Thirdly, as France and the US are both Western cultures, finding common grounds is probably more about favoring one value or one behavior you already have, you already share, but wouldn't necessarily put first. For example, if you want to launch a new product in France, it might be about finding the right balance between a perfect design and a speedy launch, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now let's look at our first question. How relevant is clarity to communication? Well, it might seem an odd question. You'd obviously want clarity to communicate, but do you really in all contexts? 
We've all attended a family gathering or an alumni meeting where we could jump right into a conversation without much context or explanation and know exactly what's going on. There are a good illustration of what a high context culture is. The first one to develop the concept of high context culture is the anthropologist Edward T. Hall in the late 50s. High context cultures are about teams. They're relation oriented. They are better at implicit, indirect communication and nonverbal cues. The other end of the spectrum, cultures with low context are based on individuals. They have a direct way to communicate their ideas and need to state their messages loud and clear. The US are a low context culture. This probably comes from the fact that with the simultaneous waves of immigration from all around the world, you had to simplify your messages to be understood and to be very clear on what you thought and needed. So how can you actually know the US are a low context culture? Well, for example, Americans often make their opinions very clear by communicating them on stickers at the back of their, of their car. That's not something you would do in France. At work, Americans are very good at advertising who's doing a good job by hanging the picture of the employee of the month in the office for everyone to see. Not something you would do or see in a typical French office. And many Americans write straight to the point, bullet point emails, when French people are more likely to draft more detailed, more nuanced, paragraph-shaped emails, carefully choosing their words to frame a comprehensive picture. It doesn't mean that all emails in France are short novels, but that's just to give you an idea. So when doing business with French people, remember they belong to a high context culture compared to the US. The French are usually more comfortable with implicit information and how to decode a room and have a somewhat more nuanced communication style. To many Americans, French people communicate their ideas in a manner that might feel more winded or unclear or open to interpretation. But keep in mind, that's not a ploy on their part. That's just the way French people show respect by explaining all their thinking and by leaving an interstitial, interpretative space to align. And I believe on that note that, Chloe, you have a good example uh, of what Americans call KISS. Yes, of course. So KISS meaning keep it simple, stupid. Um, one thing I noticed when I first started working in France as a French American, um, I usually, having been in you know, customer service and sales and account management for many years, um, I would always leave my emails saying, let me know if you have any questions. And in France, you say, je reste à votre disposition, which if you were to translate that word for word, it would be, I remain at your disposal, which in America, that would never fly. I think most Americans here would agree. We never say that. So what I usually would tell a lot of my French colleagues when they wanted me to translate something into English is I say, what are you trying to say? <laughs> because, and I'm sure everyone can agree, you cannot translate word for word. So I think that's something I definitely learned uh, having lived in Paris and working here. Uh, great, thanks, Chloe. Now, let's look at what matters the most in both cultures. Is it rules or is it relations? And I'd like to do a poll with you uh, to submit a question to the audience. Uh, so I think that Daphne has um, put the poll uh, in the poll section here. Um, so it should show on your screen uh, for you to vote. So the question is, when doing business, what are French people more used to? Is it applying rules or is it building relations? Building relations is winning. <laughs> We have 71%. Uh, okay, yes, absolutely. Agree more. <laughs> absolutely. It might feel counterintuitive because 
France is well known for its heavy bureaucracy and layers of rules and regulations. Uh, but if you actually want to do good business in France, what matters the most is building relations first. Good work happens through relationships and trust, personal chemistry and mutual commitment. That's how you'll get a team to be successful and performing. So if you ever wondered what was the point for all these long coffee breaks and daily lunches, well, you know why, that's why. Having the best process, ticking all the boxes, complying efficiently to the rules with only uh, takes you so far if you haven't built relations first. This means that compared to Americans, French people are more likely to use relations to open some doors that would otherwise be locked by strict rules. You can see that in two different situations. If you send an email to someone you've never met, how likely do you think you are to get a response from them? Well, in France, chances are poor compared to the US, let alone chances to get a positive response to them from them to that email. Which brings me to the second example, that of the art of networking. Many Americans are accustomed to doing business or interacting with people they don't know well. They are not shy about approaching their prospective counterparts in order to obtain or seek information. In France, networking is about who your network can introduce you to. And I can imagine that you might start thinking French people might be more flexible with the idea of favoritism. Well, rest assured, France is a democracy that applies the rule of law, just like the US, but it's probably more open to hear individual cases as French people are more open to favor relations to rules. So as Americans, uh, you should keep in mind that building relations first will help you be more successful in doing business and recruiting French people. And I think that Chloe, you have a firsthand experience as an account manager on that question. Yes, I do. So when I was in the United States um, working in Los Angeles, hi to everybody who's in Los Angeles, um, I just remember my managers not really encouraging us to meet with clients face to face unless there was a problem. I don't know if any of you have had this sort of advice. Now, when I came to France, oh my goodness, we would meet with our prospects and our clients for we've for lunch for two hours or we could meet with them in the mornings or in the afternoons for a long meeting because we really truly believe in like the relationship with the client or the prospect so i felt like i've been more encouraged in france to meet with my clients um, rather than the us where it was more on an emergency uh, level but again i come as an as an account manager and i'm sure in other roles in the us you see them more often but that was my experience Thanks. Thanks, Chloe. Another element that differentiates the US from France is what being the boss means. Within American organizations, hierarchy is established for convenience, superiors are accessible, and managers rely on individual employees and teams for their expertise. Both managers and employees expect to be consulted, and information is shared frequently. At the same time, you can say that communication in the US is informal, direct, and participative to a degree. A good example of that is how common it is to call powerful people by their first name in the US. French companies, however, usually have one or two hierarchical levels more than comparable companies in the US. Power holders have privileges and can sometimes be perceived as inaccessible. Their communication is more formal with their employees. A good example of how power is displayed in France is the fact that CEOs of big companies are called PDG, which stands for President Directeur Général, President Director General, which is a more prestigious abbreviation than Chief Executive Officer. And unless you know them very well, you will more likely call them ma'am or sir, uh, but not by their first name. 
And this is especially true, for example, of someone like Jean-Paul Agon, who's the, the CEO of L'Oréal, uh, but probably less uh, in the startup industry or in smaller companies. I've mentioned networks a few minutes ago. In France, power is centralized in the hands of a few networks and alumnus, most likely based in the Paris region. This means that as an American, you can quite easily identify where power lies and where decisions are made. That's quite convenient when you want to recruit an expert in a specific field. So when in doubt, when working with French people, you should try and understand are the most senior people presiding meetings by sitting at the end of the table? Following local etiquette, who are you introduced you to first? When someone does a presentation, do they focus their attention on the most senior people in the room or do they look equally around? This should give you an indication into how important status is to them. And if you're interested in finding more on this, there is a Dutch social psychologist called Gert Hofstetter who developed uh, the notion of power distance. And you'll see um, uh, in, in the memo that we'll share uh, with you after the, the, the webinar, you'll see um, that France scores relatively higher on the power distance dimension uh, than uh, the US. Uh, France um, scores at 68 out of 100, whereas the US uh, scores 40 out of 100. And uh, so you'll find the link uh, to his works uh, in, in the memo. Now let's look at how decisions are made in both countries. In the US, the best decision is often one based on speed and reactivity. Many Americans need to have just enough information so as not to make a bad decision. And, when they, and then they adapt to what comes next. That's what minimum viable products and continuous improvement are all about. So there is a fair degree of acceptance for new ideas, innovative products, and a willingness to try something new and different. American mindset is more open to trying again and again, and failure is valued as long as it helps you learn. This explains why there is a higher tolerance towards um, what bystanders or interns might think, even if what they suggest are not tried and tested ideas. Many Americans have a can-do mentality. It's about getting the job done, uh, like we said a bit before. It's about tasks, deadlines, deliverables, and ultimately, it's about the bottom line. This drives individuals to strive for quick results within the workplace. And as a consequence, American businesses are used to measure the performances on a short-term basis, with profit and loss statements being issued on a quarterly basis. The French are more uncomfortable about taking risks. As Gert Hofstede has shown, the French don't like surprises when it comes to business, and they score high on the uncertainty avoidance dimension. They actually score 86 out of 100 when the Americans score 46 out of 100. Structure and planning are required in France. Decisions have to be well thought through and often contextualized into a conceptual framework. The American tendency to jump right to the point, to bypass conceptual discussions, I have to say they seem lacking in necessary rigor to French people. And that's why before meetings and negotiations, you'll find French people wanting to receive all the necessary information. It's their analytical, their Cartesian, their rational way of thinking that needs to back everything up with facts and figures. And this can be perceived as a slower decision-making process. And it's not uncommon for top managers to get involved in minute details. 
But there is an upside to that. And the upside is that French are good at developing complex technologies and systems in a stable environment. And that's how and that's why French uh, were good at developing nuclear power plants or planes or fast trains. So before expecting a quick decision to launch an innovation on the French markets, you might want to consider how much your French counterparts are used to the test and learn approach and how much they're used to discussing new ideas in large groups with all levels of seniority. And I really hope that you don't infer from what I'm just saying that France is bad as ma at making decisions or poor at innovating. Decisions are flexible in both the US and France, but it's just that their approaches are different. And for instance, getting the product right might be more important in France than being the first one on the market. Chloe, would, would you like to add something about that to share a personal example? Yes, of course. Um, having done sales, tech sales more specifically in both the United States and in France, um, it's true that in the US the sales process is quicker um, than in France. In France it's a little slower. Uh, just as uh, Delphine had mentioned, they take a little more time to understand the product and taking less risks. Um, however, as an account manager on the flip side, I have noticed that the French are a lot more faithful when it comes to having that client uh, account manager relationship. I don't know if some of you who've worked as account managers agree or not, but I have noticed that working here as an account manager, having those relationships with my clients has made my retention higher than in the US when I had the same sort of approach. Um, Americans are, you know, would li like to take risks with different products and retention can be difficult uh, compared to the French market. That's my experience. Mm. Yes, makes complete sense. <laughs> Presentation. And in a few minutes, uh, we'll open the session to questions and we'll have plenty of time to, to, to have a, Q, a, a proper Q&A session. But before that, last but not least, um, the art of disagreeing and saying no. We've seen that Americans have a more visible can-do mentality, which even translated into a political slogan with Obama's, yes, we can. And Americans might use more often what we call upgraders, such as the word very, as well as they use adjectives like fantastic, awesome, amazing to describe a deal or to give feedback to an employee. And they'll actually more likely start with the positive when they give feedback, um, which is not something that we often do in France. On the other hand, Americans will be more circumspect when they don't agree with the decision in a meeting. They're more likely going to use an understatement and say, mm, not sure I agree, which really means I completely disagree. And that I can assure you is not clear to French people at all. So how do the French do it? Well, when discussing business, French people are more used to challenge the status quo and to play devil's advocate to identify all aspects of a question. Debate and even confrontation, I have to say, is okay in a French meeting to make an idea as good as possible. And it's quite often believed that a certain degree of conflict will bring out the best in people. And that's probably why when they give feedback, French people will often forget to state the positive and they'll jump right into the negative and into what should be improved. Even to agree, French people often start their answers with, no, you're right, which doesn't make sense at all. The French have uh, crafted a variety of ways to say no. We're quite good at that. Um, from ça risque d'être compliqué, which means what that may be complicated. And that's probably one of the least confrontational ways of saying no to a request. Um, and it means that it's unlikely to be granted. There is also the no that really means, I don't know, je ne sais pas, it's the I don't know, no. 
And as for c'est hors de question, it's out of the question, that's perhaps the most definitive version of French knows, as it really cuts off any hopes of arguing one's, one's case. As a result, non in France does not always mean no. In fact, the French no is often an invitation to debate, to engage and better understand an, one another. Because often, yes, there is hope. So con contrary to what you may think, the French do listen and well, but this usually happens after they say no a couple of times. It might take a certain amount of effort, but you can always find ways, uh, find the yes behind uh, a French no, if it's there. Tying back to what we first saw on context role in communication. Countries like the US are low context cultures where people generally say what they mean and mean what they say. But in France, messages are both spoken and read between the lines. So when doing business with French people, remember that to many French, answering no gives you the option to say yes later. But when you say yes, you feel that you're stuck and you can no longer say no. Whereas Americans are more comfortable saying f yes first even if it means saying no afterwards. And one last suggestion, if you're afraid of a spirited debate with French people in the workplace, you might want to build a fixed time for debate into your meeting agenda for the group to pull each other's ideas apart. And when the debate time is up, the decision gets made and the group can move on. So there would obviously be a lot more to say on cultural differences between the US and France in doing business. But we'll stop here for today in order to have a chance to hear you, because we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. I suggest you write your questions down in the question section, uh, and you can always, um, so that Daphne can keep track of them, and we'll answer as many as we can in the, in the time that we have left. And to give you the time to write down your questions, I'll add a couple of things uh, about what's coming next. So we'll send you a memo with the key takeaways and sources to go further. And also, for those who want, uh, you can register to a 30-minute free one-on-one -on -one session with me to discuss your individual context in the coming week. There are several slots available. And Daphne is going to post the Calendly link for you to choose what's the most convenient time for you. So please keep on sharing your questions in the question section. Uh, and just before we start uh, with the Q&A part of this webinar, Isabelle is going to share a few words with you, uh, and then we'll start the Q&A. Thank you, Delphine. Thank you. So let's have, OK, now that our agency Global Mobility Services so, you know, when a company decides to move its offices and expatriate its staff, it's often difficult to manage both the business and the employees. We can help relocate your employees and their families with a range of free services. We can give general information and advice in English on the different steps of the relocation process, including visa, residence permits, work authorization, social security registration, and taxation in France. We can connect you with our partner Business France and its welcome office team. We can provide information about the housing market, prices, neighborhood, costs, required documents, and connect you with real estate agents, bank and insurance providers, guarantor services, providing leases, guarantees for tenants, and utilities providers for internet, phone, gas, electricity, etc. We can assist your employees in finding the most suitable schools from nurseries to high schools by informing about the different types of schools in France, providing a list of public and private schools with information on enrollment process and costs, connecting with French and bilingual private nurseries and arranging, arranging appointments if needed. 
We can give you also information about the French healthcare system and registration process to social security, connect with health, healthcare insurance private providers, and provide lists of English, German, and Italian speaking practitioners. We know that an expatriation is successful if the spouse can also find his place. That's why we work with different partners like APEC, the public agency that helps young professionals and business executives to find work in France through market information and tailor services to prepare the job search. The last services in our assistance are optional with fees. We organize discovery tours to know more about popular and international residential districts or French language courses, relocation services, outplacement companies, and intercultural coaching and training to accelerate spouses' integration. To carry out our assistance, we rely on a network of more than 50 external partners to help you from simple advice to tailor-made services, such as immigration and social welfare formalities, legal and tax experts for impatriates, relocation agencies of flat hunters, real estate agencies specialized in furnished rentals, housing guarantors, utility service providers, bank and insurance companies, and jump seeking and integration partners. For international schooling, we have dedicated points of, to contact, of contact to guide you and find a suitable school or nursery. We can also provide booklets and guides with useful information for your expatriation to Paris region. Then you will discover in Paris region an unexpected quality of life. Paris is the world capital of gastronomy with Parisian cafes, starred restaurants, and numerous foreign specialties. Paris is also a green region with more than 400 parks and gardens, three, uh, four, sorry, four regional nature parks, including lakes and rivers. Paris offers also a large range of leisure with an important cultural offering and a lot of sport club and facilities. Welcome then to Paris region. That's all for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. So it's time to go to our Q and A. Um, so please, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the question tab and to vote for your favorite question. I see that we have already um, a favorite question from Bill, so I will ask them um, to you guys. Is this hierarchy that you were talking about, Delphine, still true in startups? I know it was true when I worked there many years ago. Uh, it's actually a very good question. And I think, uh, Chloe, you have the experience of working in, in startup in Paris. Uh, and so maybe you, you can take that one first uh, and let us know what you think. Absolutely. Um, so I've had the privilege to work for a small startup and a medium-sized company. Social Bakers is actually a medium-sized company. Um, and in both cases, it was a very autonomous setup. Like I could speak directly to the CEO um, as well as the VP of marketing and the CTO. Same goes for Social Bakers. Um, I've been able, I can, I can, we use Slack as a messaging system. We can Slack our colleagues across the world and, and different levels. And it's completely autonomous, which I know is probably not the same in other industries. But for me, it's been that way. Yeah. Delphine, do you have anything else to uh, add on that? I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a bit different in startup. Um, great. So we have another uh, question from Olivier. Um, do you agree with the saying that Americans are peaches and French are coconuts? So I think it relates to networking and how you build relationship. So I don't know if you're familiar with this um, saying. So Americans, uh, their peaches, though, they're very soft at the start. It's very easy to talk to them. And then you reach, you know, the hardcore and 
there's no one you can't enter it and French on the contrary it's hard to uh, build the relationship but once you're there uh, they're friends for life so what do you think uh, Chloe, I see you, you, you're agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more with this saying. It's so true. It's so true. Americans are very bubbly and we're like your best friend when we first meet you. Um, and then the French, it's, they're a little, I like to say a little more reserved, um, but they're your friends for life. So yes, I completely agree. <laughs> Yeah, it's about the um, how important it is to build relations in in on the long term. So that's that's where the the focus would be for French people, I guess. Yes, I agree with you too. I've been living in New York for six years now, and it's true that it's easy, <laughs> easier to talk to people first, but then not to make friends there. Yeah, and we were, we were we were discussing with Chloe also the fact that it's probably uh, more broadly accepted to make friends uh, at the office in France and to keep those friends outside of the office even when you once once you leave the company. Whereas in the U.S., it seems that it's less likely for you to keep your friend your 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 colleague friends once you once you've left. Yep, that has been my experience. <laughs> Agreed. Um. So next, let me check the poll. Um, so we have Justine asking, I try to ask people to lunch or for coffee. It's much harder because it's, I started this new job not long before people started working from home. I ask for advice as a way of making connection, but I still don't seem to be able to make connections. How do you, I launch relationship at work? So. I assume, Justin, you are working with French people. Um, it's true that the work from home has changed a lot for everyone. Um, I don't know if, Chloe, you have uh, experience of maybe a new colleague joining uh, during this period? Yes, actually, I have something to propose to Justine. <laughs> Since we are all working from home, uh, something my boss had actually come up with during the quarantine period in France was virtual apéro. Uh, that is exactly what it sounds like, <laughs> where basically we would, you know, talk at the end of the day amongst colleagues on a Zoom call. And if you're a new colleague and you just started, why not start a virtual apéro with your colleagues and you grab a beer at home or a glass of wine and some cheese, I don't know, just like you would be at a brasserie in Paris and just talk on Zoom, just like everyone else during this pandemic. So that's my suggestion, just a fun little calendar invite, virtual apéro. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> And it's it's probably also about how social you become with with um, with all of your colleagues. I know that um, uh, lunch breaks are very important, obviously, when we're not quarantined <laughs> and when we can work in the office. And that the notion of cantine, uh, so it's basically all having lunch at the same place, all together, uh, is probably important. So it might be also be a, a good way to start building relationships versus you know asking someone to go out and have lunch in a cafe or a restaurant uh, as a one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Olivier. Another quote from Emily in Paris, <laughs> coming back to it. So Sylvie, she is the French boss of Emily, tells Emily, you shouldn't be talking about work at a party. True or false, knowing that it was a work-related party. So uh, what do you think? Complete, completely false, completely <laughs> false. <laughs> False. That's, 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 that's a myth. That's a myth. Obviously, French people do talk about work at parties. That's, that's obvious. There are some some cliché in the show. Some are true, and some are less true. Um, we have a question from David. What if you are a French citizen but have never lived in France yet? So I assume you will face the same challenge as an American, Delphine. What's your take on that? Absolutely. Um, and if you are part of the French people who don't live in France but come back to France for holidays, for the summer, for Christmas, um, so you're, you might be familiar with how French people behave, uh, but you might be facing what we call a reverse cultural shock, uh, meaning it might feel familiar 
go, coming to France to, to work and, and to live uh, because you've been there already. You might have some family there, some friends, uh, but actually it's going to be, it's going to feel probably quite strange and you won't have your bearings at first, uh, which might be quite distracting because you're supposedly French and so you're supposedly, you supposedly know your bearings. Um, so you just have to give it some time. Thank you. Um, next question from Asha. Um, how can a female expatriate, I am Australian, working in Paris, overcome the glass ceiling in a traditional large French company? Uh. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm currently um, supporting a, an, a, an Australian lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coaching her in, in, in this kind of, and, and she has this kind of, of, of questions at the back of her mind. And I can tell you that the only option for you is to play on your own assets. It's to play the Australian card. Don't, don't be tempted to try and imitate uh, what your French colleagues would do. That's probably not how you're going to be able to differentiate yourself, uh, even to overcome the glass ceiling. So I, I definitely uh, play your, your, I definitely advise to play on your, on your own Australian assets. And if I have a, an advice for Asha, it's maybe to book a complimentary 30 minutes with you, Delphine, so you can go deeper sure. on the subject with her. Of course. Um, Another question from Bill: Is there more or less ageism in France than in the U.S.? Huh. A complicated question. I'd, I'd be I'd be tempted um, I'd be tempted to say there's probably more in the workplace in France than in the U.S. Um, because France has has probably a more a, a tighter um, um, uh, social norm on people retiring and then no longer working. It's much order in France to have people who are retired and at the same time work, which is mm, probably more common in the US. Uh, so this means that you, you, you might feel you're becoming out of touch with the Fr with French workplace probably sooner. Uh, there is a very disturbing um, notion in France on the job market that you're labeled as a senior when you're when when you're 45 and plus which means basically that you're at the very end of your career when you're over 45. So this to, to give you an idea into why I think that ageism is probably more, 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 more common in France than the US when it comes to the workplace. And, and Chloe, in the startup world, what, what do you see? We have the idea that all the startups are very young, but in fact, I think the like age is for CEOs are mostly, you know, from 40, 45. So what have you seen so far? Exactly. Um, to, to go off the point, what, uh, Delphine said, like, I definitely have seen, um, that like in, in the like high execs ages would range between 35 and 45, um, for the startup I was working in, um, as well as in the medium, small, medium company that I'm in now. Um, and it's true that after the, the age of, of 50, 55, unless you're a professor, I don't really see too many French people working as much. Um, in the startup world, you do see a lot of younger people right after college. Um, but that's basically my experience is that executives between, are usually between the ages of 35 and 45. Thank you. So I'm looking at the questions. Um, question about bureaucracy. Much has been said and written about French bureaucracy, l'état, going all the way back to Napoleon. How would you describe <laughs> and advise about French bureaucracy? I know, Chloe, you mentioned that when we <laughs> were preparing the, the webinar. Yeah, um, when it comes to French bureaucracy, um, as far as like administrative stuff, like, yes, the French are really into like administratively doing things a certain way, right? Um, very black and white. Um, but I, I feel like things are moving in the tech world. Um, so things are definitely evolving. 
Um, I don't know if Delphine, if you have other points on this, but uh, that's what I'm noticing. <laughs> Yeah, it's about the burden of responsibility when it comes to French bureaucracy. It's about making sure that the people that you that you that you talk to um, aren't uh, put at fault uh, by not asking the right documents or not asking you know the right questions. So it's really about sharing. It, it's really about helping them, um, helping bureaucrats uh, feel that they're doing the the right job. And yes, it means you have, you sometimes need triplicates of, of, of copies uh, of, of documents. So yeah, it's really about um, the burden of, of responsibility on that one. I should add that, you know, when you're uh, French coming to the US, you feel the same about US bureaucracy. <laughs> so I think bureaucracy uh, <laughs> you know, is the same everywhere in the world. If, if I can jump in and make one comparison, I think every American can agree with this. DM uh, same thing. I don't know if it was only me, but I couldn't no, I, hear you. No, I, I couldn't hear uh, Chloe either. What a teaser. And well, I think there was a couple more questions, but I think we're getting at, at the end of this session. And do, you, do, you, do you mind? Um, I, I'm seeing uh, a question from someone called Jimmy Zhang uh, about hierarchy. Would you, would you mind just putting it uh, up so that we can quickly? Um... Absolutely. Um, yes. Would you say that younger or more international companies, the hierarchies are less rigid? that there's more opportunity to explore and do tasks that are more outside your role and insight. Please go ahead. So for me, it's two different uh, options. Younger companies, probably international companies like the, the L'Oréal or the Total, uh, which are multinational companies, they absolutely have lots of layers of hierarchy uh, and, and are probably less open to explore um, um, L lower, um, fewer levels of hierarchy, uh, but younger companies, yes, absolutely. Okay, so I think it's time to uh, wrap up. So please do stay connected, um, stay connected with us, follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe to our newsletter, check out our website for upcoming events. I've share, shared the links uh, on the chat. Um, we have upcoming event regarding how to get your business started in Paris region. We'll talk about legal framework, taxes, incentives. Uh, I don't promise it would be as fun as today, but <laughs> <laughs> relevant information as well. We do have also uh, webinars about business insights, uh, going deeper into verticals. The next one will be about video games in Paris region on November 10, and we have much more coming up in 2021. So here we, you have all the emails uh, to reach out to Chloe. You can do so on LinkedIn. I shared a LinkedIn on I'm the back. chat. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think Reach out to me on LinkedIn. <laughs> people got what you tr were trying to say at DMV because I saw some comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Reach out, everyone. It was so nice meeting you. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I think we had nearly 100 people today with us. Uh, so I wanted to say a huge thanks to our speakers today, Delphine, Chloe, Isabel. It was great to have you. And thank you for all of you for attending. We hope you had a great yeah. time. It, it was such a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. De delighted. I loved it. Yeah. Thank you so much for being there and attending this webinar, guys. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It was very great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Enjoy the rest Thank of you. your day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.